Okay, so about three years ago, when I left my full-time job, I had a choice. On one hand, I could work for myself, something that I had been curious about for 16 years, ever since graduate school. On the other hand, I could have taken a safer choice and worked for another company here in Japan. So in the beginning, I actually pursued both paths. I tried both out. I wasn't sure what to do. Thankfully, over time, I ended up working for myself. And so far, that has been the correct path. So unfortunately, though, that is not the best way to get started. And that's why I'm here tonight. I want to help you make a better decision if you're interested in working for yourself as a designer, as a writer, as a coder. So if you're interested in that kind of business, today I hope to give you a few tips to help you make your decision. So my name is Anthony Griffin, and through my brand, Saga Consulting, I help small and medium-sized Japanese companies communicate abroad through social media management, content marketing, copywriting, and communications consulting. So before we get into the main part of our presentation, I'd like to take a moment for appreciation. So first, I'd like to thank Asama and the whole Blink team for really putting this together so quickly. Um, originally, we thought because of this coronavirus situation, we'd have a small crowd. But then when we were preparing this week, we realized we might have a bigger crowd. So Asama was very quick in moving to bring this online. And we could not have done that without the other party I'd like to thank, and that's Life 14 Productions. So without them, we could not be bringing this to you at this quality level. And finally, I'd really like to thank all of you who are watching this live. I know you probably wanted to come here and network and interact, but thanks for working with us. Thanks for putting up with the technical challenge, challenges, and um, thanks again for your time. So without further delay, let's talk about finding your first clients in Japan. So first, let me talk a little bit about myself. Why am I here? Why am I telling this story? Who am I? Let's talk about the story thus far. So I'm 40 years old, which means I grew up in the 80s. And during that time, Japan was huge. I'm from California. Japan was incredibly popular. And I was heavily influenced by Japanese pop culture when I was young. Why is Godzilla? better known as Gojira locally. Why is he here? Uh, that's one of the first images I remember as a child from Japan, for better or worse. So fast forward to college, and my interest in Japan got serious. As a business major, I had to study Japanese for a year. That's the foreign language I chose. I thought I would fail miserably. However, fortunately, I did well. I had an excellent teacher from Japan, uh, Professor Yoshiko Hain Sensei, and I fell in love with the language and the culture. However, I wasn't ready to leave the country yet. So I went on to follow my dream and work for a video game company. Many of you, many of you may know Activision, probably the largest game company in the world right now, famous for the Call of Duty series. So I went and entered the working world for a while. However, I wanted to do more. That was a fun job. It was an awesome experience. But I wanted more. So I returned to the University of California, Riverside, and earned my MBA. And during this time, this is when I got my first taste of working for myself. So as an intern, as part of my internship, I actually became a consultant and helped my best friend at the time create his business and start his business. And through that, I learned about invoicing, copywriting, uh, working with clients, and consulting. After that, however, I wanted to work full time. So I started working for the city of Riverside, my hometown, in marketing. 
And yes, cities have marketing departments. My job was to help attract businesses to our community. Now, how does this connect to Japan? Riverside is a sister city to Sendai. They have the longest lasting, longest standing sister city relationship between US and Japan. So that means occasionally we would work on marketing events between our two communities. And if you go to Sendai today, right now, you can see one of the marketing projects that came across my desk, one of 200 projects I oversaw. And it's basically a statue, a giant statue of an orange. Riverside is famous for citrus. So that brought me closer to Japan. Also during that time, I started vacationing. And I took two vacations to Japan, fell in love with the country, and then decided maybe I should try living in Japan. So in 2009, I came to Japan through a company called Eon that many of you might know, and quickly became a corporate instructor working in their head office. This was an amazing experience. As a corporate instructor, I got to work in a Japanese office. I was sent to four, Fortune 500 companies, and I could work with executives and managers in these companies and to learn about Japanese business, learn about their pain points, uh, learn what they were concerned about. So this was a, an excellent experience to learn Japan. However, I really wanted to get back to marketing. And thankfully, there was an opportunity at the American Chamber of Commerce here in Japan. So there, I managed their social media content. I managed photography and videography at events such as the Women in Business Summit. And perhaps most importantly, I oversaw the relaunch of their website. Now, you might be wondering why this picture is here. This is one of my favorite memories. Um, one of the things I loved most about this job was working with the Japanese government. Now, may, many, maybe many of you think, oh, well, that sounds tough. That sounds frightening. They are incredibly nice. I had a blast. And this picture of the prime minister was actually taken on my cell phone. And the reason for that is his security detail encouraged me to get close to him and take a picture. I was trying to stay back, <laughs> let the professionals take a picture, but his security team was very kind, and that was an incredibly fond memory. So I had a blast working with the chamber. However, eventually I wanted to do more. So in April 2017, I decided to try working for myself. And that brings us to what I'm doing now through my brand, Saga Consulting. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, so Saga Consulting by the numbers. So again, it's a company of one. It's a sole proprietorship. In Japanese, Kojin Jigyo Nushi. So I typically work alone. However, I partner with other organizations and partners to take on bigger projects when necessary. Um, let's talk about profitability. So the kind of work I do writing, social media management, coaching, is very low overhead. You don't need an office, you don't need a big team to get started doing that. So technically this business was profitable from the beginning. However, it took eight months to become what I call life profitable. And what that means is business and work that I could live off of. You know, paying my bills, paying for food, rent, and uh, saving on top of that. So it took about eight months to become life profitable. And so far, things have been going pretty well since then. And these days, I keep a pretty full calendar. Typically, I have about a one-month wait list to take on new large projects. So, so far, so good. Now, enough about me. Let's talk about you and what you hope to do. And let's talk about the challenges ahead that face you if you are interested in working for yourself in Japan. Number one, if you're starting something new, you have no brand in a country where brands are everything. The next challenge, you have no reputation as a sole proprietor or a business owner in a, company, in a country that values rep, rep, sorry, <laughs> in a country that values reputation. 
Next, you might not have points of differentiation. How are you going to be different from the other writers and designers and coders and photographers out there? So these are the things you need to figure out before you start your business. And that's the good news. You can develop all of these things before you take a risk, before you start your own business. And that's what we're going to focus on today. So let's talk about laying this foundation, laying the groundwork for your business. So my first advice is going to sound a little strange. My first advice, especially if you're young, coming out of college, get a job. <laughs> uh, you know, start your business, get a job, and do well at that job. Excel at your job. Think of your job as a way of getting paid to learn. We often think of school as the only place that we learn, and we think of our jobs as just income. But jobs are learning opportunities, and most importantly, you get income. So you can look to the future. You can build towards the future. Also, while you are working, this is the time you need to build your network. Don't build your network right when you start your business. Start building it up while you are working for different companies and learning and getting paid. Next, and this is mainly for the foreigners in my audience, uh, learn how Japan works and learn Japanese. We're going to talk about that more later. Now, there are two important caveats to this. Number one, do not exploit your employer. That is not what I'm saying. Give them all. Give them your best. And we're going to talk about why you need to do that soon. And also, do not burn bridges. You may need to cross them in the future. So again, get along with your colleagues. Help them. If you have to change jobs or leave your job, leave on good terms. Now, I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Seth Godin, my favorite marketing author. So he's going to introduce the next section of my talk. And if you haven't read his books, your first assignment after this presentation is to go out and start reading his work. So he says, the challenge lies in knowing your market and knowing yourself well enough to see the truth. So let's talk about what that means. Prove yourself and test the market before you start your business, well before. So this hopefully is a years long process. Whether it's six months or six years, start working on your business well in advance. So first, you need to build a portfolio. Now, I often give this advice to young people. And the first thing they say is, Anthony, no one has paid me to write anything. No one has paid me to design anything. That's OK. You don't need permission to write. You don't need permission to code. You don't need permission to do your creative work. If you love coding, if you love writing, if you love designing, whatever it is you love, you should be doing it anyway, whether or not anyone is paying you. And you should be putting that out into the world. So build a portfolio, whether it's paid work or not. And I will tell you right now, sometimes the work you write for yourself or a small audience is more valuable than the work that you pay for. Because remember, if you're writing for yourself or writing for fun, it's authentic. Oftentimes, the work you get paid for is a compromise. It's a compromise between you and the client, which is fine. That's business. But oftentimes, it's your most authentic content that will attract your next client. So start building your portfolio no matter where you are in your business planning stage. Next, establish your personal brand and web presence. I have a whole seminar d dedicated to this. That's how important this is. So um, that means keep your LinkedIn profile updated. If you don't have one, get it going, especially if you're young and out of college. You want to start building the network you need in the future today. Next, create a landing page if you need to, a personal website to host this portfolio, to show off your content. Um, even if you're not ready to start a business now, these are things you need to build up ahead of time. And most importantly, 
save as much money as possible. I don't care if you're planning to start a business in six months or six years, always save up. How much did you save? Uh, most experts say six months of co comfortable living. If you are risk averse, maybe save up to a year. So please keep that in mind. Let's take a book break. So in every section, I'm going to provide recommended reading. My goal is for everyone watching this uh, program to have something to take away, some uh, piece of knowledge. And these are the books that have literally changed my life personally or business-wise. The first one, The Startup of You. This is by Reid Hoffman, the co-founder of LinkedIn. This is an excellent book if you want to learn about personal branding and how to take appropriate risks to get started on your own. The next book, The Lean Startup. This is an amazing book for testing and validating your business ideas without losing a lot of money and to learn what your clients really want. Uh, both of these books have had a huge impact on my life and my business. Next. Finding your first clients. So if you followed my advice so far, over time, now you should be ready to search for your first clients. Let's look at some sources. And again, if you were an excellent employee and you kept good relationships, if you're fortunate enough, your first clients will be your former employers. So let's take a look at what that looks like. If you did great work, your former employer is happy, they will probably want to keep working with you in some capacity after you leave the company. It's most people and companies want to work with what they like, what they're familiar. It's very uh, expensive to hire someone new to do what you did. So consider that. You might be able to work for your former employees on a contract basis. It's a great way to get started as well. We talked about network and building a network while you were working. Your first clients will most likely come from that network. So if you've been networking, other companies, other people are going to know your work. They're going to see what you have done for your previous, previous company. And when they find out through your LinkedIn profile or your social network that you have started your own business, they may approach you and ask you to contribute your work to their company. So again, business can come from that network you have been building up. So I'd like to mention a few brief case studies. Um, number one, for me, in my case, Eon. I came and worked for Eon when I first came to Japan. And still, on occasion, uh, I still work with them in a client uh, relationship. So the, our relationship still continues. With the ACCJ, uh, about once a year, I work with Anthony Tran of Life 14, and we go out to Kansai, and we film and produce interviews for their guest speakers over there. So we're still working together, and it's, it's an incredible experience. And then finally, a, a new client from my network would be HLS Global, a global advisory and tax firm. So we connected while I was working in my previous jobs. They saw my work the work I was doing for a company, not as an entrepreneur. And when they found out I was leaving, they said, can you do this for our company as well on a contract basis? So again, your former employees can be your first clients in Japan. Next step, another way to get clients is to convert part-time jobs into contract work. So what does that mean? What does that look like? So whether you're a designer, a writer, or a programmer, when you start out on your own, especially in Japan, take a look at the part-time job listings. If you see something that you can do, contact the person who posted the job or the HR manager and talk to them and say, I can do this job. However, it would be more efficient if we made a contract. This is a, usually a win-win situation. You know, if you're a writer, you don't need to sit at a desk in someone's office. You don't need to use their resources to get the job done. It's more efficient for both parties for you to 
work as a contract worker or have them as a client. So usually if you make this pitch, you can turn something that normally would have been a part-time job in your field into a client. Let's talk about the case study. So in my example, most of you know Tadaima Japan. Some of you think that is my website. That is not my website. That is a client that started in this fashion. I saw their job post as a part-time job. We agreed it would be better to have a client vendor relationship. And now I produce weekly content for them and also meet with them for marketing consulting. So uh, these, this advice is based off of real cases. Next step, how to find clients work with intermediaries. Middlemen, as they say. Now, working with a middleman has a bad reputation, but again, as someone starting up who doesn't have a reputation, I believe this is a good strategy. Let's talk about why. So, working with a middleman means subcontracting with larger firms. In Japan, if you want to work with a bigger firm, they're probably not going to choose you if you are just a new sole proprietor on the scene. So let's take example Dentsu. If you want to work with Dentsu, it's very unlikely they're going to hire you know, a new single sole proprietor. However, Dentsu does have smaller companies that they work with. And you might be able to work with one of those smaller companies as a subcontractor. So, what are the advantages of this? Number one, this will give you an opportunity to see what it takes to work with these larger companies, to learn what they require, and hopefully in the future you can build your business in that direction. Secondly, you can grow your network again. You can get exposed to these bigger circles and other people in these large companies. And most importantly for a startup, you can ensure steady cash flow with these kinds of contracts. Now, there are some caveats that you need to be aware of. As we know, um, if you are working for a middleman, you have less control, less autonomy. You need to work under them. And of course, lower profit, lower revenue. You can expect to make half as much as you normally would or less. However, if you're just starting out, I think the trade-off is worth it. And let me remind you again, please be ethical if you take this approach. Do not burn bridges. Do not try to take clients from the middlemen. It's probably not going to work, and it's just going to hurt your reputation. So do this ethically. Uh, don't try to take any clients. Just enjoy the cash flow, enjoy the experience, um, and learn. Always be learning. Now, uh, to my foreign friends in the audience, uh, I know this is painful, and a lot of us resist this. However, this is incredibly important if you want to have a sustainable business in Japan. And that is, you need to learn and use Japanese. Now, um, you should be able to network, sell, and do some tasks in Japanese, such as meetings and emails. However, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be flawless. I am certainly not a great Japanese speaker, but I'm willing to try, and I'm willing to put, show the effort. And what that does is it reduces the risk that Japanese companies have in working with you. You don't want your client to have to work to work with you. You need to lower their barriers to entry. You need to make it comfortable for them to work with you. And being able to use Japanese, at least to a certain level, is the easiest way to do that. So this is very important. Let me give you a, a concrete numerical example. In my case, about one third of my revenues depends on my ability to function in Japanese. Um, that's how important it is in Japan. So again, as much as possible, learn and use Japanese. All right, let's take our next book break. So books that will help you with this section of the presentation, Getting Everything You Can Out of All You Got by Jay Abrams. Um, the reason I like this book is that it is filled with concrete, actionable advice 
to reduce risk and grow your business, especially regarding pricing strategy. So a lot of people ask me, how should I set prices? Check out this book to learn more. Next, Rework. I love this book because it shows you that there are millions of ways to start a business. You don't have to do what everyone else is doing. In fact, there are advantages in being different. So definitely check that book out. And then final advice is a podcast, the Creative Class Podcast. Um, this is mainly for freelancers, but it works for small businesses as well. And especially the first one to four seasons give tons of clear advice and guidance on working for yourself. Now, this is targeted at Western audiences in America. However, a lot of it still applies to Japan. Now, for the final section of this topic, let's talk about marketing. So again, I'm a marketer, and a lot of people ask me about how to market when you start your business. And these days, everyone is obsessed with digital and SNS. However, I have a unique message to share about how to get to know your first potential clients. So for new small businesses in Japan, surprise, digital marketing isn't always the best sales tool. Why? Well, again, most business interactions here are relationship-based. And if you run out and put an ad online or uh, try to sell your product on social media, very few companies and organizations are going to trust an unknown face on the internet. So it's usually not a great way to sell writing services or design services and so on. So instead, consider digital for building brand awareness, establishing social proof, showing people what you can do, and most importantly, consider it for communication with potential clients. Here's an example of a sales funnel that works um, for people like me and usually how my sales funnel works. So it's important to build trust offline and online. You, unfortunately, you cannot hide on the internet and run your business here in Japan. You need to get out and meet people. So in my case, usually I meet potential clients through networking face-to-face -face first. They need to see who I am. They need to make sure I'm a real person. Uh, they need to hear my elevator pitch. After that, we exchange business cards. Hopefully they go home to their computer and check out my digital portfolio, you know, profiles, SNS pages. And in that stage, they compare what I talked about in person to my work that is online. Then after that, hopefully, after building a relationship, we'll have a consultation. They might request some samples, which I'm happy to provide. And if all goes well, finally, we'll make a contract. So in a typical funnel, usually larger companies will have digital at the top of the funnel and have a different order. But for me, I think it's very important to meet people in person and talk about your business. So real quickly, I'd like to share my digital marketing mix and how I use different social media channels here in Japan. First up is what I call my lead platform, LinkedIn. Now, this might sound counterintuitive because LinkedIn isn't very popular in Japan. However, for my target audience, which are Japanese professionals who are global-minded, who are trying to do business outside of Japan, it's actually a really great network. Additionally, it's a great place to show off some of my content. It has a blogging platform built in, and it's a great way just to uh, share useful information to my network. Um, so this is my lead platform, and I keep a very professional tone here. Next up is Twitter. So this helps me reach and generate awareness uh, to a larger audience here in Japan. Twitter is incredibly popular. Uh, here in Japan, so it's important that I'm visible to potential clients uh, here. And uh, Twitter is useful because it's pretty easy to get your 
face and your business in front of larger companies through the use of hashtags and retweets. Also, it's a great place for business intelligence. You can follow people you respect, follow people you admire, um, and learn from them as well. And in this platform, I keep a semi-professional tone. Next up, Facebook. Uh, most of you know I'm not a heavy Facebook user. Um, the only reason I have it is because it's so popular here in Japan. So Facebook simply functions as a landing page for potential Japanese customers. It's a place where they can find me. That's it. Um, so what that means, for example, once I was uh, pitching and you know, speaking with a potential client, uh, a CEO of a small company, and he would only communicate through Facebook Messenger. Nothing else, not even email. Um, so for situations like that, that's why I have a Facebook account. That's how I use it, and I keep a semi-professional tone. So next, finally, Instagram. And so far, I believe this has been incredibly useful here in Japan. Um, perhaps the best way to connect with Japanese clients, and here's why. Number one, this is a visual medium. It's all about the picture, and it's casual. So I don't have to have perfect Japanese. It's OK if my Japanese is, is a little awkward. That's all right. People are focused on the images. Also, hashtags work very well in getting your content in front of relevant audiences. And Japanese is my second language, so I don't need grammar to use flash, uh, hashtags. Excuse me. Um, you know, as long as I know kanji, as long as I know the vocabulary, I can leverage flash, uh, sorry, hashtags to get in front of customers. And also a nice thing about this, and I have to say Facebook, is sometimes it's a nice way to generate a little bit of awareness before I meet a potential client in person. So one, one time I was pitching a tourism organization in Shinjuku, and when I came into their office, they said, hey, I saw your work on Instagram or Facebook. Uh, so they knew who I was before I talked to them. So that was a nice benefit here. So again, why are we doing this? You've all heard the statistics that 80 to 90% of businesses fail within the first few years of starting. Those are some poor odds. My goal with all of this is to help you beat those odds uh, to help you be more successful with less risk. So let's review. The key takeaways are, number one, get a, a good day job if, if you're young and you're entering the workforce, and excel. Do your best at that job before, well before you start your business. And you can do this for years if you need to. There's no rush. There's no rush. Secondly. Maintain relationships with former employers, convert part-time work, and leverage intermediaries or middlemen to find your first clients and stay in business to build momentum. And finally, use digital marketing to communicate your value to your customers and communicate with them. So with that, I'd like to open it up to Q&A. So we do have our skeleton crew uh, here in the room. Um, however, the vast majority of you are online as well. So you can type in the chat box. We have people monitoring the chat feed, and they will send me your questions. But while you do that, is there anyone in, in our crew here that has a question? 